Welcome to Coffee with Lynette. Today's guest is Patrick Wood, and I'm so excited. Uh, my personal opinion is that this man is brilliant. He's written and studied about globalization since the 70s, co-authoring a book with, uh, with um, Sutton, Anthony Sutton, Trilaterals Over Washington. This is his current book. You can see it's kind of dog-eared because I've been devouring it. And I think everybody needs to be aware of this. So I'd like to welcome you today, Patrick. Thank you, Lynette. Great to see you. It's excellent to see you. So mm -hmm. with, with all of your, you know, I'd like to start out maybe talking a bit about Agenda 2030, which in reality, as they put it together, doesn't really sound all that bad. I mean, I'm a, I'm a farmer now, I have an urban farm in, in central Phoenix, and so I'm all about sustainability, but somehow it incorporates people, the planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership, all good things. So can you explain from your perspective what this is and why this is a threat to us? Absolutely. Uh, a good con man always leads with the promise of something, whatever it is he's offering. And that's my sense of the first few tenets of 2030 Agenda. You have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that they published. Uh, they sound great. It starts out, the very first one, eradicate poverty everywhere. Right. Well, who's not for eradicating poverty? I mean, if, if I ask you, to, oh, and if you don't like that, say, oh, so you want poor people to stay poor, huh? Well. You know, they have about the first five or six items are that way. But when you get down to the fine print and you look at the history of how 2030 Agenda came about, you'll see that what they're after and all we have to do to, to get, get these promises are turn over 100 percent of the means of production and consumption to them. And this is insanity. They want to define what businesses are allowed to make, and they want to define or regulate what you as an individual consume. If it's not sustainable, it's off the list. And some of the things that they have declared that's unsustainable would make the hair stand up on the back of your head. I have the master book here. I won't show it to you, but it's the, the Biodiversity, Biodiversity Manual, about 1,200 pages of, of stuff they say that golf courses, for instance, are not sustainable because it consumes too much water and what are other resources. They say that cattle uh, are not sustainable because they give off too much flatulence. That's cow farts for you people that don't know. Um, they say that automobiles are not sustainable and that we need to convert from combustion automobiles uh, to whatever, maybe riding bicycles. So this is, the, this is the sense of Agenda 21. It's a document for control over all economic activity. This was seen, by the way, Lynette, uh, way before the United Nations had any influence in this area. The concept of technocracy, which is sustainable development in its modern form, originated in the 1930s, and here's what the original definition said for technocracy. You can see this connect here. They said, technocracy is the science of social engineering, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. Everything is wrapped in to that definition. Mm -hmm. The word entire, everybody has to play ball. The word scientific operation of the social mechanism, that's us, right? Distribute goods and services. Well, that's the economic aspect of it. They want control of everything and they want to be the ones, the scientists and engineers, they want to be the ones who control this whole scientific engineering project. That's Agenda 2030 or 2030 Agenda. Well, that kind of leads into China 
leading the shift because aren't they a technocratic government? Very much so. And Where? they just concluded their agenda here. I'm going a little bit. But they just concluded their, their uh, every five-year meeting and they stated uh, government, the military, society, and schools, north, south, east, and west, the party will lead them all. So how does China fit into this? Well, it's, yeah, obviously it's complete autocratic control. China was identified publicly, by the way, as a technocracy as early as 2002 by Time Magazine, no less. So that, you know, not that they're so authoritative, but there you go. You know, it's in Time Magazine. Um, <clears throat> remember, China was opened up originally back in the early 1970s by Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski, oh. both of whom were members of the Trilateral Commission. Mm -hmm. Most of the early adopters in China, the companies that went to China to do massive development projects and infrastructure projects were related one way or another to the Trilateral Commission. In other words, the people that were on the boards of directors and so on tended to be within the ranks of the Trilateral Commission. These are the people that swore to create a new international economic order. And so when they went into China, uh, and I'm talking, you know, the big companies, the Caterpillar tractors, the the uh, Deere and Company, the uh, 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 the Bechtel Engineering's of the world. They went in there and they developed China from being a backwards agrarian society into being the the monolithic powerhouse that it is today. We need not forget that these people are the ones that put the money in. They put the talent in. They brought all the technology to do it, and they brought the, the desired political system in that they wanted as well, which was technocracy. A lot of people think that China is a communist dictatorship. It still has the trappings of that. But most of the members that you just showed that were in that page have advanced engineering and scientific degrees yeah. from their university, some from ours too. But, right. but that article says, pointedly, the new chairman says, who has as much power now as Mao Zedong did, they say, uh, don't live there, so I don't know, but that's what the press is saying. He himself said in that article that China moving forward is going to be an engineered society, <clears throat> an engineered society. That's scientific engineering. Right. That's what and they're that doing. They're completely integrated in every single aspect of society <clears throat> That's and right. the education, et cetera. So they can yeah. f develop people <clears throat> to support this technocracy. That's right. It's much easier, by the way, to have a technocracy in an autocratic system, political system, because technocrats hate politicians. They mm -hmm. always have. Back in the 1930s, when FDR was just coming in as president, local technocrats at, at, in, at, uh, with, in the Eastern establishment actually wrote a book calling for FDR to declare himself dictator so that he could implement technocracy. The reason that our government has been such a pain in the, in the rumpus to, the, to technocrats in general is that we still have all of the vestiges of of power to the people, you know, the Constitution is, you know, whatever, just our society in general, they don't like parliamentary governments. They don't like democratic governments at all either. And so what you have around the world today is a melting down of democracy, as, it, as it's called by the socialist and the communist, a melting down of socialism in favor of technocracy. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what Dr. Prague Khanna called for earlier this year when he wrote a book called Technocracy in America. He said, democracy is broken. Our country is broken. And what we need is direct technocracy. Oh, wow. OK, so what does that mean? Well, he, yeah, wrote, the, exactly. he, wrote, the, he wrote the book. I'll hold it up in a minute if I can find it here. He wrote the book and he said, well, here's what we need to do. We need to abolish the office of the president. And we need to have a committee 
of presidents, like China has. You just showed them, right? He says, we need to get rid of the Senate. The Senate is a useless body. We need to replace it with a, a, a council of governors from the states. And the Constitution, he says, ah, we need to give that to the Supreme Court. Let them modernize it for us. You know, make it, make it, bring it up to date. And he says, as far as civil service is concerned, we should turn that 100% over to experts, right? To run everything with no political input whatsoever. This radical technocracy, uh, Lynette, is sweeping the world, and they have their, what do you say, their, their, uh, their scope is on us because we're the last remaining pocket of resistance in the right. world to their plans. And you see China is coming on strong. I, I'm sure we'll talk a little more about China. China is sweeping every category away from the United States right now, whether it be technology, whether it be fintech, which is financial technology, right. uh, whether it be just you know social engineering in general. Wow, they're coming on strong. And they're saying in that document, they are going to be the global leader by 2030. Well, that gets us back to that agenda 2032 and also all of the things that they're doing to surveil and control their population, controlling the Internet. But all of this new surveillance techniques, can you talk about how that fits into everything? China is over the top on surveillance. Americans are not alarmed at this. They should be. They should. But be. they're not yet. But China has so many levels of surveillance right now, it's not even funny. They have uh, bioidentical, like facial recognition uh, technology all over the country. They're building a massive database right now of voice recognition of all their citizens. They have created social scoring programs that suck all the data out of society about you <clears throat> and, you know, all your posts on face, Facebook equivalent and so on, they know you better than, they, than you know you, and they're assigning a social score for those people who are most favorable to the, to the government. <laughs> and if you don't have, it's kind of like a credit score over here, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a 700, you're going to get food stamps in the mail. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. If, but if you are 300, you're likely going to get kicked out of the apartment you're living in, if you're lucky enough to have one. If you're going to school, you're going to get kicked out of school, and you're going to get denied credit and shunned from society because you don't fit in. Right. This is so Orwellian in nature. It is just, uh, it's over the top. That's all I can say. This well, is I what, this is technocracy, however. All but we think, but oh. see, the thing is, is that we think that that's not happening here. And I just read an article on your site yesterday where it was talking about the light poles in the cities being oh. equipped with the ability, and the city's getting paid to put this technology in that does the same thing, right? Voice captures your voice, mm. your facial recognition, everything. It does. And let me explain why this has happened this way. Most of the technology that they're using in China is patently illegal in the United States. It really was. But these companies that were making this stuff here, the big, many of them big tech companies that were making it, well, who cares? Forget the United States. China loves us. China will take us in. China will let us do whatever we want to do because they want to control their people openly so and so we'll go over to China and develop the technology. And then what happens is it gets re-imported back to the United States as sensitivity is lowered in our country, as laws are changed, they bring the technology back and wham, it's on us now. Mm -hmm. This has happened in several tangible instances in the last 20 years, by the way. So this is not a new pattern. This is the way it's done. The companies that are developing the technology in China the original technology that seeded those companies came from the U.S. of A. Right. Period. End of subject. We have created this monster 
that now wants to recreate us. And they do, and they're they're getting more and more power. Um, that's is that a lot of what you're talking about too is that geospatial engineering. Oh right? boy, I know, Where I know. They, <laughs> I've learned so much since our first meeting <laughs> a few months ago. It's like, oh my God! I mean, a lot of this I had no idea, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers yeah. had no idea. Can you talk a little bit about that geospatial well, engineering? I can. This is a relatively new field to the world of anything, made possible by being able to identify people and track people as they move about, whether it be facial recognition or voice recognition or, or your smartphone you're carrying with you. It knows where you are. Or when you go in to make purchases and stuff, you know, your credit card immediately gets sucked up into the cloud. And the people that want to know what you're doing, they all know. So the idea of geospatial and uh, 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 geography, everybody understands a map where, where you have a house or a, or a building. It's on the, it never doesn't move. It's just there. And pretty much every building on planet Earth and, and feature has been uh, identified and cross-haired with, geo, you know, with uh, uh, longitude and latitude. Geospatial intelligence is a twist on that in that they're saying that you individually, and maybe the car you drive and the train you drive, you are a feature of the geography, but the problem with you is that you move around. Mm -hmm. So you go from your office to over here, you go downtown, you go to the drugstore, you go to a, maybe go to a church on Sunday, whatever, you move around. The geospatial intelligence crowd, and it's huge, it's embedded in our government, the, the military is studying this like crazy. It uses artificial intelligence plus the data of you moving around to figure out what your crowd, what your, you know, what your people look like. In other words, everybody belongs to a cell of connections, right? You mm -hmm. have friends, you have employment, you have your vendors where you go to do stuff. And so a crowd can be managed according to art with artificial intelligence software as they move around. And here's the here's the danger in this, Lynette. It's not that they want to know what you're doing as long as you're being normal you. If you're normal you, that's not a problem to anybody. But when you or another member of your group steps outside that envelope, a little alarm bell goes off. And if two or three people in your group step out into an, you know, outside the envelope, they get louder. And if all of a sudden, if you, if you're, if you're identified as the ringleader or one of the leaders of that, if you step out your envelope and all of a sudden you're taking trips to pick anywhere, uh, Singapore, you know, whatever, all of a sudden you're showing up, taking a five trip to Singapore, but dang, but dang, but dang, something's going on with that group because they're operating outside of the of what we have considered to be the norm. The norm. That's geospatial intelligence, and it's. I, I don't want to alarm anybody if I say it's scary. <laughs> but, well, I'm telling you, since uh, since we met, uh, like I said, I've learned so much, and there's a lot of scary things. This, I followed a link from one of your articles, and the title says, The Future of the U.S. Military. And this is actually from Defense One Today newsletter. Yes. Okay? So I went to the source. I started at your site. But the future of the U.S. military is constructing a giant armed nervous system using geospatial engineering of people, places, things, everything, they now are cooperatively building this huge armed network. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to sign up so that they would send me articles <laughs> until I saw what they asked me to put in in order to do that. And I went, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just, this is too creepy. I'm not going there. Right. I understand. I've, I've done that a few times myself. Uh, <laughs> right. This But... You know, when we're looking at the monetary system in that context, if you're doing anything digital, well, 
that's easily that's easy to track. Even if you think you're anonymous, they can see the movement. You, at some point, you're going to have to go into a hub. They can connect you with the transaction. But if you're using either cash, which is at this juncture not really traceable. I mean, they have they have things in there, so maybe they can actually trace the cash. But certainly, physical gold and silver is not traceable. So that would be a threat to them, wouldn't you think? It is a threat, and that's why there's been a war on gold ever since 1973. Mm -hmm. It's never let up, not for one single day or one single month or one single year. Uh, right. In fact, my, my co-author, Anthony Sutton, wrote a book called The War on Gold. I read it. it and he picked book. it up. He picked up on it way back then. Mm -hmm. Gold is not in, in a favorable situation with, uh, with this crowd at all. And we will end up in the end with uh, we, we could have a two tier system where where we, the little people, have to use a digital currency so we can be tracked. But there might be a there might be a place for gold one day in international trade, you know, between countries instead of using letters of credit. and So on. they might actually trade in gold. But that is never going to be for us right. because it is because it is not controllable. Right. <clears throat> let me let me interject something about privacy. Sure. And just the whole idea of what we're talking, we're kind of dancing around this topic here, but I want to hit privacy head on. Good. If you have, if you grow up in a family, how much uh, about you is known by your parents? Just about everything, right? Mm -hmm. You expect that. The, the child isn't nervous because the parents know everything about him, but the child expects that the parents love him and do not tend to harm him. Right. right. So they don't use the knowledge in an adverse way to harm the child. Now, if you're if you're in a marital relationship and you live in a house, for instance, and, um, you know, how much about you does your spouse get to know over time? Just about everything. She, they ought to. Right. Right. And you might uh, you know, you might freely even run around your house, both of you with no clothes on. There's no big deal. You know each other. You're absolutely comfortable. With the, with the knowledge of each other. But when you extrapolate that kind of knowledge out to society at large, all of a sudden, everybody knows everything about you that used to be only reserved for your spouse or your parents, right? Right. Now, since knowledge is power, it always has been. People with evil intent can use that knowledge against you for your harm. Right. That's the risk here. Young people don't understand this yet as they post on Facebook their Everything. most intimate details of life. Everybody knows who they are on Facebook. And of right. course the government does too and all these other organizations do as well. But what, they, what they're gonna find out really soon is that because the people collecting the data have a bad intent for them. They want to control them. Exactly. When they feel the claws going into their back, okay, it's probably going to be too late for them to do anything about it. But they will cry and scream and moan in pain as it comes as they as they get controlled like so many cattle in a giant feedlot. Yeah. That's this is, I've been trying to explain that to my children. They're millennials. Yeah, I guess they are millennials. No, they're Gen Xers. Yeah. Uh, but we've been, we've been slowly trained to give up more and more and more of our privacy. So that's right. a really good point. You know, yeah. um, the other point in that, uh, too, and it goes back to the technocracy, is the individual ownership of ability to gather wealth, to pass on to generations, et cetera. If they have full control of absolutely everything you do and you have no privacy in there, but you're also not allowed to own anything. I mean, is that a two tier thing too? Where those that are at the top that control everything, can they have ownership there? And just they as do. little guys? If, if I could boil down the entirety of technocracy as well as sustainable development, which I believe are functionally equivalent, 
Yes. Here's the scam. Okay. The people at the top, the global elite that are driving globalization, these people are trying to capture all of the resources of the world. That's what they want. They're done with money. Money has been sucked dry. They want now to get the resources themselves that produce the wealth in the world. Okay, it's a resource grab. That's all it is. That's a big con job that, mm -hmm. you know, all the rest of this stuff is just so much confetti. What they're trying to do is grab the resources of the world, put them into something like a global commons trust right. that will be ruled by them. You will never see the light of day on those resources, by the way but they will be able to have license to work with those resources, to do stuff with them, to make products and so on. You'll never see it. But all of the rest of this, sustainable development, is to control the population and to control the consumption of population. And, and isn't that supposed to be according to need and who determines what that need is? They, they determine what the need is. It's exactly right. It's, it, you know, the, the big thing that's floating around right now in sustainable development circles is your carbon footprint. Right. You know, there, there are calculators out on the Internet now. You can just search for one, a carbon calculator or, or carbon footprint calculator. And you put in some data and it will give you a score on how high or low <laughs> your carbon footprint is. And if you're over consuming... Oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> you know? Right, they want to tax you for your <laughs> that too, that's right? That's exactly right. So, you know, if you uh, if you live in an apartment and you have no lawn, no grass, nothing like that, and you ride your bike to work and you, you own an electric car plus, you know, whatever, and, uh, uh, you know, you're not known for buying an excessive number of shoes or whatever, you know, at the, at the store, why, you're going to have a score that's very low and you will be accepted in the new society. This is much like what China is doing with their social scoring uh, system right now. But we are already, honestly, we are already being scored by the government according to this carbon footprint nonsense. And, you know, it's all about consuming carbon and stuff. Well, you know, hey, we are carbon, we are carbon based entities. Based. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, ideally, the best way to cut down on carbon emission in the world don't take me wrong here. I'm not. I'm not advocating this. But the best way to cut carbon emissions in half, for instance, is simply to eradicate half of the population. Hmm. Because we breathe carbon dioxide with every breath, right? right? I can see it coming out of your mouth and mine too, right? Right. <laughs> carbon dioxide, evil, evil, evil. You know they say it's not. Whoever died because they pulled the covers over their head on a cold winter night. Right. Come on. Right. That's not a poison gas for Pete's sake. But a lot of people believe it is. What kid never went under the covers with a flashlight and a comic book and read after his parents told him, you get to bed, right? Exactly. How many, I did that myself. How many kids have died from carbon dioxide? None. Mm -hmm. Not one. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> It's like it's the most insane thing you've ever seen. Lynette, in the end of it, it's a con. It's just a it's a con on the entire planet. And the sooner people see it, there might be some possibility to resist it. But right now they don't. Okay. Well, what can the you know, that kind of leads me to what can we do? <clears throat> here's what here's can a, we do to resist it? Here's a tan a tangible example. We need to re renovate and renew our own communities where we live. That's number one. I'm there the, with you. The city councils of our country have incredible power. A good example is Visa recently started offering $10,000 to any restaurant that would go cashless. Right. Last time I looked at my dollar bill, it says legal tender, good for all debts, public and private, right? They can't do that. That's illegal in our country, yet they're doing it and nobody's challenging them, nobody's right? Challenging them. Yes. Now look, you could go to your city council and you could give them a case. I think there's a beautiful case. <clears throat> you could give them a case that if Visa comes in and does that in your city 
it's going to hurt the economic development of your city, number one, and it's going to hurt employment in your city, number two. Yes. And in any case, what they're doing is illegal and you think it should be blocked. The city council can pass a resolution that would absolutely and definitively bar Visa from coming into your city and offering a restaurant $10,000 to go cashless. And people say, well, that, oh, that's not the case. Listen, it is. How many cities around America did not allow Walmart to come into their town? Exactly. Or other Good big point. box stores because they said, no, we're not, we don't want our local economy to be wrecked by these big, big box stores, right? Right. How did they do that? It was the city councils. City council. They said, you ain't a coming in here. Don't even bother with an application. And they didn't. They just went away and they found another city that was stupid enough to let them in. Mm -hmm. So the city councils have incredible power. And I have to say other boards and councils in your county board does too. Your, your, your fire board, your water board, your school boards, they all have influence that needs citizen participation to set them right. That's all. We could send a message up the food chain, I'm telling you. We really could. Yeah, and it's, so it starts at the local level. And it starts it at to. that community level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The national level right now is pretty much out of luck. The right. government is not going to be like the old Western movie, you know, where the cavalry comes charging over the hill, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, like that, you know, horn blowing and, hey, there, we're saved. That's not going to happen here. The government yeah. is not going to come charging in and rescue us from any of this stuff. Not now, not ever, be, and primarily because they are the perpetrators exactly. of this whole thing. Yeah, you made a really incredible point in that book that, you know, you said that um, corporations have shareholders, the governments have shareholders. <laughs> and your answer was, absolutely, it's yeah. the corporations and those multinational corporations. That's right. That's exactly right. So we have a lot of stuff going on, going on around us that is, when you see it, it's visit, you, you understand it more as you start right. to see the picture. You see a lot of stuff that, oh, wow, I, I didn't see that before, but wow, there it is now. Exactly. Um, this guy that wrote Technocracy in America, Prague Khanna, he wrote a book, another book before that, called Connectography. It was it was early masterpiece, by the way, brilliant book. I don't agree with one word in it, well, a couple, but the guy is on, not on our side. He's a technocrat. He wants mm -hmm. to convert America into a technocracy, okay? But he wrote in his book, Connectography, he said, we're building this global society. And he's, a glo he's a globalist, right? He's one right. of them. We're building this global society without a global leader. Global order is no longer something that could be dictated or controlled from the top down. Globalization is itself the order. Wow, that's this pretty is, interesting. This is a brilliant thought, in my, in my opinion. I agree with that. Because is. this is what I see happening with technocracy. They're building the system to be the dictator, if you will. That's right. the essence of a scientific dictatorship. It's the rules, the algorithms, the policies that are set in that you can't escape. There's nowhere to get redress by, from them. You can't go and complain to a software engineer because you don't know his name, nor where it's, he works. Nor that's <laughs> the whole decentralization that they keep selling, that people go, oh, that's great, that's great, right? Because yes. you, you have no recourse. It is. And Kana, Kana uh, forcefully makes a case that what America needs to do is de deconstruct its government. He calls it deconstruction and pass power back down to the states. In other words, get out mm -hmm. of the way, get out of our way, go do your petty little social politics, you know, down on in city level or county level or whatever. But stay out of our way on a national basis. Deconstruct national government. This right. is the most one of the most dangerous trends we have going in our government today are the calls for deconstruction 
of our government. Not that I agree with the agencies that are there, right. by the way, because right. I don't. If I was like Ron Paul, I'd go in and axe half of them on the first day. But uh, that'll never happen, and it didn't with him, and it won't with me. But uh, there is a great outcry amongst the political elite to bring deconstruction to the American government and return everything back to the state. Who knows how this is going to turn out, but this plays right into what Prague Khanna wants to do with our country. Well, now you're going to send me in a new rabbit hole. <laughs> Thank you so uh, much, Patrick. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. No, that's all right. That's one we thing need, I love about all of this. Listen, in our business, we need lots of shovels. <laughs> yes, we do. And I think we have some questions that people have been asking. So Ali Mohammed Ali asked, what the guest opinions on cryptos are. So Good what's question. your opinion on cryptos? Cryptos are unquestionably, in my mind, <clears throat> going to be center stage when technocracy is complete. Absolutely. It's maturing at this point. You can't point to this one or that one or whatever and say for sure that that's what it's gonna be. But the handwriting is on the wall, I believe, that blockchain currency is going to be the future for fintech. And having said that, let me throw into this, the Chinese, if you're not aware of this, the Chinese were the first to perfect quantum computing blockchain codes, security exactly. codes. They can do it from space for Pete's sake, from satellites now. America's not close, apparently. But the fact that they have pioneered this, this super, super encrypted, uh, impossible to break, in, in my opinion so far, using quantum computers to generate the code, this will revolutionize FinTech. China is in a position right now in a driver's seat. If they move this forward, they're in a, in a driver's seat to potentially control all of FinTech throughout the world with exactly. satellite technology. They yeah, could. Aren't they talking about having full global satellite surveillance yes. by 2030? They are. They are. There's and that if, date again. If the code, if the encryption came from from space, the, the blockchain encryption, it's not like blockchain, it's way more complicated, right. but it's, it's unbreakable. And if it came from space, where the codes are you know, shot down from space into your smartphone or whatever it is, <clears throat> it's game over for the rest of the world. Right. That's going to be where it is. And right now, uh, and, and by the way, there's another, just this week, there was a, a new, ex, uh, not an exploit, but a new uh, weakness in Wi-Fi technology. <clears throat> it's called Crack, K-R-A-C-K. -A <clears throat> and what they've discovered is that, that Wi-Fi itself has been found to have a defect that can be exploited by hackers. <laughs> Surprise. Every, listen, every Wi-Fi device on our planet is at risk. Some security experts are saying this could result in Internet Armageddon. Now, having said that, the whole focus is around the security token that lives within your Wi-Fi routers and all the Wi-Fi devices that communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. That little security token has a flaw that they they can, uh, some, some are trying to patch it, but most will never patch it. That means the entire infrastructure of the Internet of Things and most all of FinTech is at risk. They're gonna have to address this, Lynette, eventually. What better way to address it, if I was a Chinese, what better way to address it than to be able to provide a quantum computer generated series of codes that would be unbreakable, unpenetrable, and absolutely 100% secure. And also <clears throat> controllable by- right. and Controllable and controllable. And controllable. That's right. And that's what we have to keep in mind. That's so, right. And they keep saying, you know, when we get everything in cyberspace, there are no limits to how low we can push interest rates. In other words, they have direct and immediate control. That's right, that's and, right. And I agree with you. I mean, unfortunately, I think this is inevitable. But that makes physical gold and silver out of the system that much more important. 
It really does, because that's the only thing that's invisible. And if you hold it in the way that the guys that write the laws hold it, in my opinion, you have a better chance of keeping it. Yeah. Is there another question, Carl? Yeah. Okie doke, let's see. He's moving some buttons. <laughs> And, okay. Oh, Kevin asks, Patrick, do you see precious metals having value as an off-grid money? And then uh, these are all kind of uh, the same? So just, yeah. No. Okay, so we'll start there. We've got three questions coming up. Yes, very possibly. <clears throat> it, could be an, it could be a source of off-grid off, off money because historically, over thousands of years, gold has been recognized and valued intrinsically by people period the problem the problem the biggest problem is going to be if gold is criminalized you'll be in trouble right not that not that you're gonna you know uh you turn in all your gold necessarily if some a lot of people didn't when fdr confiscated all the gold right <clears throat> but if you are caught using gold out in the community if it's been criminalized, you could be arrested and put in jail or right. fined or whatever, or your gold taken away. So that's the other problem that we see right now. I think we're going to see that eventually. I but definitely until... agree with that. That's why I always say, okay, what are the smartest guys on this topic doing for themselves? And if you can emulate it, you brought up Ron Paul before, you yeah. know, he only buys the collectible coins. Me too. You know, I want something that is, you know, you can't guarantee that one way or the other, but it's less likely to be confiscated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ABCD asks, are crispo, uh, cryptos immune to an EMP? If not, then why would you put your money there? Good point. Yeah. <laughs> An EMP could, could flatten the whole system. It, it would be the biggest pink slip that our country ever got all at once because there would be no, no jobs would be available because payroll couldn't be made. So everybody would go home <clears throat> and food would run out in about three days in the grocery stores. And it would be a very difficult situation. Your currencies at that point would be totally meaningless. Right. Uh, uh, it probably except for gold. Um, gold and silver possibly and could silver. still be you know resurrected to some extent. But here's the problem with that. I don't care how much gold you have. Eventually, you're going to run out because you got no way it. to re-earn money to, to replenish it. <laughs> so, right. you know, right. I say, well, it's good to have. Kind of like it's, maybe it's good to have dehydrated food and stuff like that. But just recognize eventually you're going to run out. And if there's no income, there's no jobs, there's no private property, you have no basis for replenishing yourself. Right. So it's I, a difficult. I see it. I see it more like a temporary uh, transitional tool, the physical silver, you know, some cash to begin with, <clears throat> physical fractional silver, and then your goal to convert into the big yeah. stuff when yeah. those are really cheap what in you're hoping, a way that you are right. most likely yeah. to hold, be able what to you're, hold. What you're hoping it. for is enough of a cushion to right. make it through until the entire total reset takes place. <laughs> exactly. That could be a month, six months, six years, 60 years, who knows? But, right. you know, it's, I realize it's the best shot in town for a lot of people. The greater problem is, of course, what about the masses of people that don't have the discretionary resources to put into gold and silver? Well, They're... They're just at the end of the string, and there's no, there's really going to be, they're at the mercy of whatever happens completely. Well, um, actually, a little different to that, you know, in my studies, I found that there were basically three parallel economies. One, if all you have is fiat and fiat money assets, you're 100% right. You're completely dependent on the government, and I hate to say it, but there's your depopulation. Uh, then if you have, it, because anything that's physical or any skill that you possess is barterable. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of resources, but you have some skills, like I would let anybody actually come on and help me with the farm in exchange for harvesting. 
you know, so you could take your food home and at least, you know, feed your family. Yep. And then you have the group that does actually have the gold and silver. And typically then they grow more wealthy because they have their purchasing power when those other income producing assets, physical assets or tangibles, or, or even dividend paying stocks, when those get really cheap. So, and in that way you can generate your, you know, so you can survive in one of those three ways. You just have to be prepared. I have chickens, I can barter with my eggs. All right. So, and Wong Park asks, if all currency is gold back tomorrow, gold price still rise to, I think he's saying, you know, 10,000, 2,000 and beyond. Well, how, do you want to address that? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I want to share with your listeners that I was an original gold bug. When I entered the market in 19, late 1972, uh, I was the... Of the and the very first group of early adopters of gold as an investment. Mm -hmm. And I traveled to South Africa to investigate the gold mines. I went down 5,000 feet under the ground uh, to look at the stopes and see how they pulled it out of the ground. It was incredible and scary. And uh, my clients, when I was in, in the brokerage business and financial business those early days, my clients made a bundle on gold and physical gold as well as gold mining shares. Yes. So gold is something I have a long history on. And <clears throat> I want to say, in general, to make the general statement, gold is not money. And, excuse me. Gold is not dollar bills. And dollar bills is not gold. We think of okay. things culturally in terms of, well, what price is it? Okay, here's an ounce of gold. Well, is it $500, $1,000, $2,000, whatever. This is a faulty thing. This is using a rubber yardstick to try and measure for a dress, for instance, you know, exactly. at, or, or a house or whatever. And you need accurate measurements. There's no there's no way to use the dollar as an elastic item to measure the value of something like gold. It cannot be done. Exactly. I think personally, a person needs to uh, consciously rework their thinking. So not think in terms of gold, well, is it, you know, it's a price like Bitcoin. Oh, it's $10,000 now. What's that mean? It right. could be 5000 next week. That's not the point. Is there any intrinsic value to it? Voila. Well, okay. In the case of gold, I've said this for years to people, my friends and some of my clients from way long ago. Think in terms of ounces of gold if you're going to think of anything. Make your strategy to increase the number of ounces that you own or whatever other marker you have and forget money, forget the dollar, forget the, the euro, forget the, the yuan or whatever and think of turn and it, over a period of time, if your investment portfolio in gold is not increasing in size, you've missed the mark. Now that doesn't mean just keep putting money in this nilly willy in, it means there has to be some buying and selling along the way to increase in ounces of gold relative to other things in the world. That's all. Some people have been very successful with that strategy, by the way, thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And your listener's question, just it's just kind of sparked that in my mind. It's not accurate, really, to say that dollars mean anything. Is it? They don't. They really don't. See, now everybody knows why I love you so much, because oh. that's exactly the point. <laughs> That I, that I consistently try and make. It's that paradigm shift where you realize dollars have no value until you convert them into a good or a service or right. real money. Right. And, and once you do that, then that value is fixed. But the longer you hold them, the less value they have. So thinking about gold or silver in terms of dollars, let me tell you, it, it could go to $87 trillion like it did, or marks like it did in Germany, but you couldn't buy a loaf of bread with those $87 trillion right. marks. Right, right. You know, but gold, <laughs> intrinsically, I mean, it's used across the entire swatch 
of the economy. So there is 100% of the time, there's always demand. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a great question. I'm glad. Now everybody knows why I love you so much. But uh, Roberto Sarud asks, Lynette, what would you think is the best third option after gold and silver? Well, okay, this may sound funny, but like I said, you know, anything physical. So things like toilet paper actually are in high demand during these kinds of periods of time. You know, food, the trouble with food and water, I mean, you can't live without them, but they all have a shelf life. So something that doesn't have um, a shelf life, but really anything, anything that is physical or any talent that you possess has barterable qualities. And that's what you need in addition to the gold and silver. Right. And um, what do you have any thoughts on that, Patrick? Just one, I, I suggested this, I bet, 25 years ago to people. 22 shells are incredibly barterable, and everybody has okay. a 22. They're not for self-defense or anything like that, but they're good for hunting, you know, like rabbits or squirrels or whatever, or, or maybe for self-defense. But, you know, the point is, you can buy them in boxes of 50. They're very granular and they'll always be in demand. They last forever, almost. And yes. uh, so anyway, I, I suggested that years and years and years ago. And uh, they're, they were very inexpensive back then. They're not so much, they're not so cheap now, but you know, they're still out there. If you can, if you can get it, it makes pretty good barterable stuff. Really good point. Okay. And, uh, Davidis Dawi asks, with interest rates at 0%, where does Lynette and Patrick park their cash? Would you like to start with that? <laughs> cash? <laughs> what? I don't know. What? Who's got cash? Oh, dear. Well, well you know. I have some. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I just, I, you just pretty much have to go with the flow. If, if you have, you know, taking out physical cash and holding it in your mattress is, will eventually be suicidal. It really will. Well, eventually. On the, other, on the other hand, I think anybody ought to have probably a good six months worth of uh, cash in their pocket uh, just in case uh, they need, you know, short term, something happens, disaster happens, they can get by. Puerto Rico right now is dying for cash. Exactly. They're begging for it. They're so off grid completely. I don't know it's, it's disaster. Uh, you know, preparation, having cash in hand is good, but um, <clears throat> for somebody uh, who has a lot of cash, like you know, if you're if you're a millionaire and you've got five hundred thousand sitting in a bank or somewhere, uh, you have a problem. Uh, there's no doubt you have a problem, and I, I think I've said this probably for years too, that the people who have the most money get the get the least amount of sleep <laughs> in the world. And having a lot of money brings up all kinds of worries that you don't have when you're broke. <laughs> so you have a problem. Where can you put your money? If you put it in a, uh, in a bank that's going to give you negative interest rate, you know you're going to lose money over time, guaranteed. But then I say to that, I say, so what's new? We've lost 98.5% of value of our dollar over the last 100 years. Tell me what's new there. Nothing. Alien. That's right. So, <laughs> and that's no actually safe. not new either. But that, that's right. There's no safe place to keep cash in the long run. Right. And and you know and really, why would you? There is a certain level of cash that you should have. So I definitely agree with you. You know whether it's six. It depends on your circumstance. Whether it's twelve months or six months or three months or whatever that is. Um, you know you need that as your first line of defense. But this next crash the likelihood of you having access to it at all, if it's in a bank or in any kind of uh, fiat system, is, in my opinion, negligible. You're not going to have access to it. That's right. So, if, te if technocracy wins, there will be no wealth. Right. They'll take it all away, one way or another. They'll get one it all. One way or another. <clears throat> one of the problems that I've had with, with people who want to be political active or who kind of like to be political active is that they just refuse to give up the money that they have in their hand to to fight this thing. 
they think, no, I got to keep everything for myself. I got to I got to protect myself and my family. And I'm saying, look, if you don't stop this, just look at it like fire insurance. You pay for fire insurance on your house. If you don't stop this thing called technocracy, sustainable development, green economy, you will have no wealth at the end of it. Zero at the end of it, because they want it all. If you go back and look at Agenda 21, which started in 1992, you go back and look at technocracy, they want to wipe out private property altogether. They are openly stating that. Yes. And that means not only everything that you have is private property, but your means to make private property. It's, all, it's going to be all gone. And we'll end up, all, we'll, all of us will end up being broken slaves to the system right. in the end. So, Beware of the, the uh, universal income. That's right. Is definitely that's right. a way that it, that so, it entices as, people. Here, as, something for nothing. Never. Right. As a caution, again, I would say, if you, if you want to protect yourself, get busy and get down into your local community and start building yourself a community shelter, if you will, uh, yep. you protect your community, get other people in your community to, to gather into that. It's, uh, our community is a lot like our immune system uh, on, a, on, a, on a country basis. Maybe Washington is the head, but our local community is our immune system. If your immune system is shot, you're going to get sick all the time. Yeah. Our immune system right now is shot. <laughs> We need to get back in our local community and do something to fix it up. So if you've got resources and you're thinking, how can I protect myself? Don't just look to yourself right. with a microscope thinking that that's going to solve it. It won't. Look outward into your community. Take some of the money you have. Make an investment into your community to turn it around. And that's going to right. require your personal involvement as well to start going to these meetings and finding out what these wackos and nutcakes are saying and what policies they're putting in place and and confronting them and saying, no, that's not the way we gotta do things here. We don't want Make that. Make your voice known. Yeah. That you know, I, that's the bigger side of protection than just like, well, what should I do, you know, for just me? Well, that's not gonna get you or us anywhere. Yeah. I'm afraid. What we should all do is get more and more involved in the community. That's right. That's, you know, that's going to be the ticket to save us because one person can't do it. But there are a lot of us. So together, you right. know, here's hoping we can make a difference. And here's hoping that we made a difference today. I'm going to really encourage you to get this book. It's awesome. You'll learn so much about it. Empower yourself with education. Thank you so much, Patrick. This has been really so much fun and now everybody knows why I say you are brilliant and, and I love you. We think so much alike and that's always a nice thing to do. And I hope you'll come back again. I hope that I'm here to do that. I'd love to. And don't forget, visit his sites. Everything, all the links to everything will be on our, I think they already are, on the YouTube page. Um, really, I love getting his in my inbox every day. Yes, it's a little scary, but... You know, what's scarier is what you don't know. Right. Because what that's, what, know that's what blindsides right. you. That's exactly right. My book's available on Amazon.com as well, by the way. So if people don't want to get it off my website, they can get it off of Amazon, too. And there's a Kindle version. Excellent. But Trilaterals over Washington, can you only get that on your website? It's on my website and also on Amazon. Oh, great, because I yep. think for a while you could not get it anywhere oh, but on it here. Was, it was out of print for 37 years. <laughs> That's another so, story next time. Next time. Thanks so much, and thank you all for joining and participating with Coffee with Lynette. Let's chat. Till next time, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, um, subscribe to us on YouTube, and really, don't forget to give us a call, 888-696-4653. And please, everybody, be safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Patrick. Thank you so much.